All right, thank you guys for coming tonight. This is a really good turnout. So this is the second what we're calling augmented reality lecture as part of our lecture series. And the reason why we started doing that is that it is just as important to think about, talk about architecture and space and design, but it's also a really great opportunity to be in the space and, and see it. So we're not broadcasting live today, but we are recording, so this will be available as, as part of the archive. So my name is Carl Dobman. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. And we're at Kali Ferrari tonight with Inform Studio. They're gonna lead a tour. We've got some presentation, and then we're also gonna be able to walk around, and we'll also be able to talk about the cars, I think, at some point as well. Um, but these are really fun moments to be able to talk about design more broadly. I know we have at least one transportation designer in the house with us. I wish there were more. Uh, but we're here, it's a, it's a nice opportunity to be able to talk about architecture and cars, uh, and pretty beautiful cars that are here. So it's part museum, part dealership. Um, we're, it's gonna be interactive tonight, and so we're continuing to play with what lectures are like, and how we stage these things, and where we do them, and how we do them. So we'd like your feedback as well. Um, I'll let you guys get started. So Corey and Mike are joining us tonight from Inform. Uh, Inform Studio, if you're not aware, you've been under a rock if you're at LTU. Many of you hopefully, actually, are there any freshmen? There are no freshmen here. I was gonna say some of you are probably living in a building that they designed. So they're responsible most recently for the East Housing and Inform Studio, all three partners went to LTU. So it was really strong alumni, uh, the distinct, their um, distinguished architecture alumni, award winners, uh, and advisory board, and really helpful as we think about some of the things that we're doing. Lots of ongoing conversations about technology and design as it relates to the practice. So I want to thank these guys for coming tonight. Thank them for taking the time and setting this up. And um, I don't know what else should we do. We can start. Show start some things. So Mike's going to go over the rules. <laughs> so he's going to start with the rules tonight. All right, you have a mic. I don't so, need that, I don't so think. What we will do, though, is that as it becomes more interactive, we're going to start up here with a presentation. And as it becomes more interactive, we do want to be able to capture the audio. If, you're, if you have a question, maybe just raise your hand and then grab the mic. Obviously, the mic isn't to, to amplify in the space, but it is so that we can capture it for the archive. OK? Yeah, All right. that sounds great. So uh, just real quick in terms of uh, rules of engagement, if that's cool. I know everybody's been up here and kind of looked around for the cars a little bit. Um, and I know most people probably came here to see the cars, not so much the building, which is, which is great. So uh, we want to be able to give everybody exposure to that. Um, but here's the thing about the cars. Try to keep 12 inches or so away just for protection. And if you kind of reach over or do anything like that, the alarms are actually set. So if you put your hand in or anything like that, it's going to go off. So, um, you know, it's not going to come down and like put you in handcuffs or anything, but nobody wants to be embarrassed and have the alarm go off for everybody. So just, you know, be cognizant of it. Um, I would also say sometimes as we're moving through things, um, we've got a pretty big group and some of these are a little bit tight spaces. So when we do the tour, Corey's going to lead and kind of like back walk and he's going to engage you during the tour. And I'll try to shepherd like a border collie just to kind of, you know, make sure. But just be aware that sometimes people may back up and there's a vehicle there. So that's something that we've seen before where somebody happens to bump into it just because they're backing up. So just be cognizant and of, of your surroundings, that's all. So I don't mean to overdo it, but just to give a, a kind of feel for it. So like Carl said, just to give a little bit of sense of the format. If they scratch it, how much would it cost? Uh, way more than I want to be responsible for it, so, so that's for sure. Uh, we didn't have anybody sign anything, uh, but. Just, uh, just for some statistics, I mean, a brake, swishing out your brake pads is about $2,500, and an oil change is $600 on these cars. So you can imagine the exponential cost of you know, buffing out a scratch. Priceless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for uh, kind of logistics of, of the tour, we'll do a quick intro. It's probably like seven slides or something like that, just to set a little bit of uh, context for it. And then Corey's going to go ahead and, and lead us through uh, the tour. He knows more details uh, about this space, as he um, was kind of the designer in charge of the whole thing. 
uh, in, in leading the pro project uh, really from start to finish. And then uh, we'll come back and kind of talk a little bit about some of the technical aspects after you get a chance to sort of see things. And then also I think what is a little bit exciting, we're giving uh, sort of a sense of where this project has led to propel us into things that we're doing in the future. So really brief. Um, I think one of the things that uh, will also be helpful, we'll kind of go through this intro piece, but then feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'll try to keep somewhat time, so if we need to move from one place to another, we can do that. But that way, that interactivity, you guys can ask questions when we get to spaces or rooms as he tries to talk to things. I think one of the things we're really excited about that, that Carl had mentioned um, is just the idea that there's more of an interactive uh, relationship in this. So we love the idea of doing something different and being a part of this. So, Thanks, Carl and LTU, for inviting us to be a part of it and, and, uh, and for the representation that's here, too, because it's great to see Steve and Scott and James and uh, I don't know how many others are, are here faculty-wise, but uh, it's great to see everybody here. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just to give a little bit of, uh, of context, um, what's cool about this is we can kind of point out the windows, too, uh, and I think uh, a lot of people get a sort of sense of uh, Orchard Lake Road. It's not exactly pedestrian friendly, has a little bit more of a highway architecture kind of feel to it. And so when we first, uh, and, and I think what's interesting, too, is to understand how projects sometimes start. So as a comparison, when we did LTU East, it was a client that kind of came to us, hey, we want to do a project, there's a certain budget associated with it, here's a schedule, uh, you know, we're evaluating your ability to do it. And so it's a very formalized process. What's sometimes interesting in, in, in these situations is this is prior relationship uh, that we had with um, Jeff Colley, who is the owner, uh, looking at this particular, oh, we can't do that. Uh, looking at this particular um, building, this is, uh, was Cauley Chevrolet, and this was an existing Cauley Ferrari dealership. And essentially, through longtime friendship, Jeff called Ken and said, hey, I have an idea. I think I want to do something for Cauley. Would you be interested in just kind of looking at it, right? So it doesn't sort of start with proposal. It's like, let's just talk about the ideas of what Ferrari, or in particular, what Cauley Ferrari of Detroit wants to be. So just to give you a little bit of context, we, we were very close to the road in terms of the existing Cauley Chevrolet. Um, this was the existing Ferrari dealership. And the original intention was to renovate the Cauley Chevrolet to become the Cauley Ferrari. So when we first started looking at, at this project, um, you get a sort of sense of the dealership that was existing here and then the context of this all staying. What we looked at is um, really its relationship to Orchard Lake Road. What does it mean to create an environment that is along very highway architecture? And so the thought was, look, instead of having signage and all of these components, how do we create something so that you really have this sort of view so that as people are coming either northbound or southbound, there's an orientation to sort of capture the excitement or the idea of Ferrari that's happening inside. But it was also important, as we discussed this with Jeff, that it was it, it, there has this connection to the original Casa Ferrari, which is very much about this idea of museum experience of Ferrari, and even more so, Ferrari is kind of a lifestyle as opposed to a car you buy. There's a whole experience behind it. So the intention was, the intention was essentially so we have this sort of boundary that's here, and so that gravitates to give people an exposure that's here to be able to say, hey, there's a whole world that's happening within that, but then to encase it in such a way that there's an entire plaza experience, Italian experience. There was even a discussion of a market kind of Italian grocer and all of these things sort of incorporated within it. And so this is potentially part of a first phase of a larger aspect that may go on as, as this sort of continues that has to do with Ferrari experience. So that was kind of the thinking. There was this sort of fluid motion and the idea that uh, we weren't necessarily copying the morphology of car, but taking the idea of something that has continuity, that has a, a machined kind of aesthetic to it, um, is very forward and future uh, thinking. And so this became the sort of wrapper, and then this became the sort of internal experience. And it was really, hey, we just sat down, talked about an idea, uh, and then uh, essentially presented you know, a real quick concept, just to be able to say, hey, there's this idea of these sort of cars floating out there that people can sort of see from the highway. Uh, signage is, is sort of behind, but then the idea that there's also an entry experience and where you would have uh, essentially the showroom within it. 
So as we looked a little bit further, what we realized is that, hey, we weren't going to do Cauli Ferrari in the, uh, at the Chevy dealership. We were actually going to do it at the existing Cauli Ferrari dealership. So looking at that, there was essentially this facade that we could take away, but there were uh, columns, and Corey will go over that in the tour, that needed to be maintained here. And so then everything within that kind of triangular shape backwards, we had to continue to work with. So in looking at that, essentially, this being the existing Ferrari building, this being sort of the new showroom, the kind of experience that's here, and then wrapping, and Corey will go over the additional program that's there. But essentially, now you have kind of encasing that dealership and sort of uh, floating around it. So as we looked at the adaptation of this idea of the skin here, it was essentially to be able to say, hey, we continue the same thought or the morphology with the wrapper that engages both North, this is kind of cool to be able to do, northbound and southbound in terms of that view connection, but really create this sort of entry sequence of experience. So you may notice in the ground floor, there's kind of those individual parking spaces, and then it can be uh, more of a pedestrian type of plaza that's there, but a very experiential, you might have noticed even when you were coming in, music's playing, right? It's already connecting you, and it's very processional in terms of your approach to coming in. Uh, one of the interesting things that we talked about, and this will be kind of a constant source of conversation through today, is this particular column. We hated the resolution of that originally, but we tried to get this as to be a kind of clean cantilever. So we went through this just, oh man, it was painful, painful iteration to like, how do we shape this? So there was all different kinds of sequences that were done to, to, to get rid of essentially what this would feel like. And so, uh, in essence, what we came back with is this sort of idea that it sort of smoothly come down, comes down and touches the ground. And the reason I say that that's a source of conversation is you'll see the final result and what all went into making the panels and everything else uh, within it. But that gives you kind of a, a, an overall sense of what um, the conceptual ideology of the project was to start. And then Corey can kind of take you through the program and start the tour. Um, I will say, I'm just going to back up one slide. Um, so when Jeff first came to Inform Studio and sat down with us, he, was, he told us that he was working with probably about $3 million. And you know, by the time we had sort of gone through this iteration and, and evaluated and, and redesigned and come back, uh, got a contractor on board, and uh, you know, we were looking probably closer to six. So we'd really, and at that point, he was in love with the building, so it's kind of like a little trick you can pull. You, know, you get a client, and he just like <laughs> dives into it, and they just love it. And, you know, we did as much as we can, and I mean, we'll talk a little bit about how things got scaled back, but, um, you know, really, at the, at the end of the day, it's a 53,000 square foot facility now, and when you break out the existing uh, area, we really added about 39,000 square feet, and they built it for six and a half million dollars. It's $166 a square foot. There's a lot of warehouse stuff, you know, in the back that really, you know, is, is rather cheap to build, but when you're building this sort of level, uh, you know, of architecture, and, and, and you're under 200, I mean, it's significant and kudos to the contractor for for really getting there um, you know part of that initial meeting with Jeff um, you know had to do with the program and now Ferrari is like any brand they're very exclusive obviously but they set rules um, criteria that you know you essentially need to follow in the design of their dealership so if you're in Tokyo and you're visiting Ferrari it's going to be very similar in its not necessarily in its layout but the spaces and the way you move and experience the space and the finishes in the space, they're going to be almost identical. And you can go online and check out different Ferrari dealerships uh, from around the world. Now, none of them have this outward expression. This is the first Ferrari dealership where we essentially had the ability to you know, it could be very expressive with the facade. The only requirement we had to deal with from Ferrari Direct was the use of the silver Pollock panels, the, the ACM panels that are out in the front. That was the only criteria. Use the silver panels. Everything else was, you know, more or less up for grabs. And it obviously had to be approved by Ferrari ultimately, but we'll kind of get into that. Program, very, very simple program. I mean, we're dealing with, um, you know, basically an entry space, a showroom, um, a configuration room, uh, a lounge, a couple sales offices, a delivery room, which is where you pick up your Ferrari after it's all sort of modified and manufactured and sent, and then a secondary showroom. So that, that's the front house. This area here, I'll get into the, the intent of what this is supposed to be. It's very different. Again, this, this space does not exist in any other dealership in the world. It's Jeff Colley's kind of brainchild, and he just wanted to make sure this type of space existed in his dealership. 
Um, there's, a, there's also a very large addition on the back. We're not going to get to sort of tour that today. It's very pragmatic, utilitarian. It's an addition. When, they, when Jeff closed down Chevy Colley next door, he essentially had to absorb all the function that that was doing for his Ferrari. So there's a body shop back there. There's a detailing bay, um, uh, paint booths, two paint booths. Uh, there's a car elevator, which is how we get the vehicles up here. Um, and also there's storage. They don't want to park any of their cars outside overnight, so the upper level in the back of house here can uh, hold, I think, 35 Ferraris. So that's it uh, for the program. Um, we'll come back up here and sort of get into the nuts and bolts of everything. Um, we'll just kind of keep this really fluid, and if you want to just follow me down, we'll kind of just stop almost at the bottom of the rail here and kind of collect and talk a little bit about each program element. If you guys have questions as we're going through this, just, you know, fire them away. All right, so everybody hear me okay? All right. So, you know, Mike had mentioned in the beginning of the, the, uh, the lecture the, the idea of the experience, and I mean that really drives everything that happens in this dealership, and any Ferrari dealership really. I mean, they've, they've got this thing, you know, right down to a science. Um, the building, you know, very sort of fluid and expressive on the outside, but once you move inside, it really does become all about the cars and everything that's done on the interior is is meant to be very understated subtle soft tones of you know neutral beiges and whites um, the odd sort of you know hit of red which again is very brand specific but things like this lit f1 wall um, which i mean at night as you're driving around driving along orchard lake all backlit with leds i mean that's very very expressive and it's one of the things that just you know captures your eyes you're kind of like flying by the building but as you come in, you're immediately greeted by uh, you know, the receptionist here at the, at the front. And I mean, it's all about service. Everything from that point is sort of controlled and directed. The showroom is pretty much open. Yeah, I mean, this is a public building. And the, they encourage people to kind of come in and check out the cars and see what's going on. I mean, really, they want it to be um, not an experience just for exclusive buyers. You know, there's very few of us that really can afford Ferraris, elite level athletes, you know, entertainers, some CEOs. But, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty exclusive club. They start, you know, the Portofino is one of the new, it was just unveiled at the grand opening of this building in May. It's probably your base model and you're getting into that for around two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000. So that's kind of like the start. And then, you know, from there, you, maybe, you could buy some used ones that are gonna be less, but brand new, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very tough. Um, but that being said, I mean, they really do encourage, uh, you know, the, the, the exposure of the brand. They want you to come in. There's a retail component to Ferrari as well. Like, I mean, you could buy luggage, you can buy, uh, you know, all jackets, anything. All, all of that is sort of contained within this dealership. It's all part of that experience. Carl's so, got a great shirt. <laughs> yeah, Carl's shirt, that's right. So, you know, as, as you know, let's just step into the shoes of a, of a potential buyer, right? You walk, in, walk into the door, you're greeted, and. You know, you kind of, these, none of these cars are for sale. These are all demos. Currently, there are eight Ferrari models. There's four 488s, two Lusos, uh, an 812 Superfast, and the Portofino. So those are, the, those are your brand new cars. That's what you can customize. And, and if you decide, I've got enough money, I'm buying a Ferrari today, you know, you're, you meet with the salesman, you kind of talk through, they find out what you're looking for. You sit down in this room here. This is called the configuration room. And I don't know if you can, everyone can see this room, but as we move sort of through the hallway, I encourage you guys just to open the door, do like a little loop in there and we'll come back out. But it's, this is like really the, the sort of where the creativity starts, right? This is the room, you sit down with your salesman and I mean, you can configure these cars like right down to the color of the thread on the seat. So. Joe, Joe has told me they, they move probably about 50 Ferraris a year, new, new Ferraris a year in this dealership. He encourages his buyers, if they can keep it as standard as possible within the sort of Ferrari framework, typically after you get out of this room, you can have your Ferrari delivered in about five months. Now, the minute you start customizing, and, and this happens probably about 70% of the time, you add a racing stripe, you get into, you know, uh, a sound, an upgrade in the sound system. You, um, I mean, there's just, it's, it's endless, the, the configurations. It starts adding months and months onto, you know, the sort of delivery of your vehicle. So you could potentially be waiting 14 months for a Ferrari after, you know, placing that order for manufacturing, depending on how customized you get. So, 
So, well, the way it works is, you know, you, you can't just come in and sort of just like, I want this car, I'm going to drive it off the lot. I mean, if you're here and you want a new Portofino, Ferrari here has to have an allocation for it. So really what they get is they get about four allocations a month. And it could be, you know, it might be two 488s and a Portofino and a Superfast. And so those are the cars they can sell that month. So if you're like, I am waiting for like, uh, you know, the new Lusso, and you got to wait for that allocation to come around. So in, in there, Joe said that there's times where they will trade with other dealerships. You know, say they're waiting for one specific model. They can trade, but again, it rarely happens. So once you, you know, if, if, it's, if it's something that you really, really want to wait for, you got to wait, and there could be a list. There might be like eight people waiting for a Lusso, and so you've got, you're in line behind those guys, right? And so maybe it takes handful of months but eventually you kind of get into this configuration room and then you know depending on how there's two level you know there's this is this is called the atelier so you can go in here and you'll see there's all the different leather selections there's the the calipers uh, the rims um, the paint selections if you're sort of working within that framework um, you know you're, you're probably you're probably within that five to six month range it's when you kind of get into the tailor-made and actually as we go through the secondary showroom there's a I think a green California, which is a 2016 uh, vehicle. It's a tailor-made, uh, and you'll see the, the, I mean, there's just nothing like it. It's, it, it's completely customized. So that, that would maybe add another $75,000, $80,000 onto that sort of base price. Um, and so like a Lusso might be three fifty. dollars Like I said, Portofino is two fifty. dollars So at the end of the day, right, you're maybe like crawling out of that room having dropped $400,000 on a new car and, you know, moving your way into the lounge to like sit on the couch and try and figure out how you're going to tell your wife you just bought a Ferrari. <laughs> so this, this lounge here is really kind of open for, um, you know, socialization, you know, the day they come in, like you've got your car ordered, you might be coming in and sort of, you know, checking on sort of status of things, but really it's kind of just like a hangout area for, you know, people coming into the space either to uh, check out the monographs, you know, there's a lot of history in this room. So it's, it's really just kind of like a casual hangout space. Um, I, so let's move, let's move this way, guys, and if you want, just do like kind of a loop through the configuration room, and then we'll keep going down the hall and hang a right, and then that's the secondary showroom, and we'll just pop in there and check out some of the cars. Just to kind of get a feel as you're, as you're moving through here over to where Corey is, if you notice the kind of smoky gray in the glass, um, it's very much to sort of set up that it's very open and you can kind of experience and see everything, but at the same time, it's giving you a psychological understanding of, hey, there's kind of a difference between public, private within this, while still allowing the kind of openness and the transparency of this. So you want to head over that way towards the yellow one, kind of collect in that area. It's fun to move everybody through this. spend a ton of time in this room, but a little bit. <laughs> Fortunately, people have... Stop looking at the cars. Yeah, stop looking at the cars. I know. They're fantastic, aren't they? He, he only has a couple of things to say, and then uh, so we spend a little bit of time here. You know, I, I just wanted to point out, so this is the, this is the secondary uh, showroom. So this, these are all used vehicles that are for sale. These are the cars that if you do have the money, you can walk in and drive, you know, off the lot with, with one of these guys. Not, th these are all demos on the floor. You can't buy them. You've got to make those and wait for the order and the manufacturing to happen. So. Um, that, the green one right behind you, that's the tailor-made, that's the California that's got a lot of customization to it. It's had a couple owners, and um, I was just explaining that uh, Joe, Joe Colley is, uh, so Joe and Jeff are the owners, Je uh, Joe is Jeff's son. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Um, that uh, there's, there's probably about a 70% repeat clientele, so like once you buy a Ferrari, you know, it's like, it's kind of addicting. You got to keep either got to keep buying them, or you come back and you swap it out. So this own, there was two owners on this California, and they just upgrade. You know, they, after a year of driving it, they wanted a new Ferrari, so they brought that back, and they're in a new Ferrari. So it's it's uh, it's a unique model that way. Um, but I uh, I think that's it for the secondary showroom. Unless anyone has any questions, we're going to kind of make our way over to it's the sort of delivery area. It's where you would get your new Ferrari once it was manufactured.
All right, lead the way. <laughs> oh, there's one starting up. There you go, Carl. Someone, someone started up. Go okay, run out. All right, so the last sort of piece of programming that we've got on this level, this is the delivery zone. So this is the area, you know, you've gone through the process, you've, you've paid your money and your Ferrari's getting manufactured. You get the call one day, it's here, then call you Ferrari, what they do is they set up, they've got the red silk cloth that kind of drapes over your vehicle. Um, you know, some people keep it low key, other people have a big party and you know, you come here and champagne and breakfast or lunch and you drive out there with your new Ferrari and kind of head onto the road, so. Sorry, um, Corey, you lost everybody because they started a Ferrari and they I heard, it out, so. I heard. Oh, well, I'm, I kind of continued. Uh, there you go. Oh, yeah. It's going the wrong way. That's a one-way one road that way. <laughs> okay, they're coming. It's, No, uh, I think that's housing going next door, but we do, there is the racetrack that we're part of in Pontiac, the M1 concourse, which Collie is very familiar with. They take their cars out there. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the M1 concourse in Pontiac. Essentially, it's a racetrack. Mike, how long is that track? 1.5 miles. 1.5 miles. We do, we've done some car condos in that area. We've done a lot of the master planning for that, so Collie's a big uh, you know, contributor to, uh, to that track with their cars. Um, Knock on wood, the event center will start construction in the next couple of months. So. Yes, if you saw, if anyone saw Mike's lecture at LTU, I don't know when that was, like in this fall. Anyways, there was some presentation, that was part of the presentation and, and yeah, that building is, is finally, uh, looks like it's moving forward. Um, architecturally, what we'll do is uh, as we kind of move out of the space and go back, back upstairs, I've, I've got a number of photos, number of sequences that really sort of show, you know, how this space, you know, came up and, and really, you know, is what it is today. I mean, exposing really the constructability and, and how this thing was really pulled together and built. These, you know, this steel column right here and really along this line, and there's another, you know, there's another steel column over here, that demarks the edge of what was the existing Ferrari dealership. So that was the structure that we sort of, you know, latched onto and then Mike was explaining a little bit about the orientation of that prow and how you know you've you've got the sort of north and the uh, and the south facing traffic. Well, that was a huge deal for Jeff. There was a lot of pressure to move this dealership to Birmingham, where you've got a clientele that's really fairly wealthy in that area. And, and you know he was committed to staying in in West Bloomfield Township. He had been here for um, you know for the most part. Colley, uh, Jack Colley, his father, opened the Chevy dealership there in 1979, I believe, or moved there from Ferndale in '79. So he had been committed to this area and he'd been here for a long time and he was really just, you know, he wanted to ensure that if I'm staying here, we're gonna do, make every effort we can to kind of get closer and really pull this building out. And so that resulted in, you know, the, the idea of the architecture sort of extending out. And again, events here all the time. Uh, Sunday, there were 80 people upstairs watching the F1 race. So a, bi a big deal was, you know, the inclement weather we have in Michigan, you never know what you're gonna get, snow, rain. This, this covered area was extremely important as sort of people pull around and they get valeted. Um, you know, that, that sort of facilitated the idea of this mezzanine. And so when we get upstairs, we'll talk a little bit about the programming in the mezzanine, but um, again, it's a very unique feature to, to any dealership. It really doesn't exist. So uh, that's it really for down here. You wanna, let's make our way back upstairs and we'll get in front of the monitor, run through some of the, uh, some of the construction slides and then, uh, sort of finish up with Mike. Hey, Corey. Corey, are we covering the connector? Yeah, so let's, I was gonna talk about what we got programmatically here. I mean, we do it right from here. So, mentioned earlier that, you know, this is very unique space. So Jeff always envisioned this space here becoming um, almost the museum, like the, the retro vehicles, right? These sort of, we've got a 90 Testarossa here. Um, what, was the, what was the year on the, on the far car? Is that 328? The 308? The 308, 328. The 328, yeah. 328, I think, was uh, 88. So a lot of these owners, I mean, are, I mean, some of these are for sale, and some of them are just, they're owners that just, you know, they, they donated the car in a sense to, to kind of have it displayed up in, up in this space. 
In fact, I, I talked to, um, and these cars here at the windows rotate. There was an 84 uh, Ferrari in the window at the grand opening, and it was a guy, he bought it the day after his divorce in 1984. It was like a celebration, and he donated, he, after you know, so many years he wasn't driving anymore, he was like, what am I gonna do with it? So gave Jeff a great deal on it, and so now it sort of floats sort of through the inventory. Um, you know, when it comes to sort of getting the vehicles up here, there's, you know, this connection across, which was uh, part of the challenge in the constructability of everything and, and really connecting the back to the front and doing it in a way that was um, delicate and, and uh, you know, really sort of unobtrusive. So in the back, as you kind of go through, like you say, this, these set of double doors opens and then there's another set. We've got about 35 cars stored up there and then the, the access to the vehicle elevator, which drops down into the body shop. Um, you know, this, this, this is kind of like a Ferrari graphic, this timeline. Uh, again, you kind of see the 71-year history of the, of the Ferrari. Every now and then, Ferrari releases what they call a supercar, and it happens, you know, maybe every 10, 15 years. La Ferrari was the last one, um, sold for about 1.4 million, escalated in price. I think once you, dealers put certain people's names in a hat, because they only make about like 299 of them, and, uh, you know, Ferrari sort of then picks from a very exclusive list of people who's going to get these cars. And then they have a contract that they can't sell that car for like 18 months. And after, after that point, then it's, you know, I think the LaFerrari peaked as high as 4.1 million and it's sort of hovering right now around $3 million. So they are investments for a lot of people. They really, they don't, they don't devalue at all. If anything, they, you know, spike. So, um, but a big, another really sort of cool feature, if this is sort of the museum piece, um, we've got, this is like Jeff's, like where we're sitting, where we were sitting in front of the monitor, it's the Casa Ferrari, and what that's, that's like a space that, in a sense, pays homage to uh, the Enzo Ferrari house in Italy. It's a, uh, the original Enzo house, when dealers go to Marinello to see the factory, to visit for tours or driving, uh, they've got like a driving school for, for dealers. Um, a lot of that, uh, they, they get the opportunity to sort of stay and hang out in the Enzo house. And so what Jeff was trying to do was capture, in a sense, the feeling that you have in that home with the, you know, sort of the, that's where we transition from this, you know, two by four, uh, you know, imported Italian tile to, you know, just sort of the wood flooring and really the sense of a, 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 a more of a, a residential homey feel over on that side of the mezzanine as opposed to this. I should also point out that Everything in this place is imported from it, like the tile, all the furniture, uh, a lot of the millwork, the custom millwork, and I'll kind of go through some of those details. All of it is imported. And so that had to be factored into the whole construction of it. I mean, you, it's, this is stuff that's getting put on a boat, you know, shipped across the Atlantic. It takes time. So it's, it's easy to kind of get ahead of, you know, the, your construction time when you're sort of sitting there waiting for something like the curved glass on the... Uh, on the office space, that, that was like the last thing to show up. And it was like ordered you know, four or five months prior to actual you know, installation. So um, the last piece that we'll talk about here, and again, I'll, I'll kind of get around, but right around the corner, one of the things Jeff really wanted to add in here was this outdoor terrace. And you'll kind of look, and it's got like a wood deck. It's the most, of everything we've seen, the most complex piece to construct was that terrace because everything is happening there. The, the, the angle's dying, it's swooping down, it's uh, coming and hitting a canted surface. The deck is dropping in order to drain underneath uh, the wood tile and that's pushing down into the uh, clearance for fire truck on the underside. So it was just, it was like this a swirl of, a nightmare swirl of just, you know, things all coming together and really having to work with the structural engineer, the contractor to, uh, to really make that, that space happen. So, so what you call um, 30% of the fee going into 150 square feet of the project. Yeah, it felt like that at times for sure. But it turned out great and it's a cool little space out there. And like I say, after we go through, feel free to kind of, you know, check it out, walk out there. So let's hop back to the monitor and we'll run through the rest of the presentation and then wrap it up. Um, I think they drive them. They might push them through the door. Like I think, yeah, just to kind of, because I mean, it is like inches. That was, I, that was something we had to be really, we must have double checked that three times with the, with the shops and like the guy uh, was Glasgow out of Detroit and they, were, they did all the curtain walls. Like make sure this hits. <laughs> it really was. 
Um, so the, the framework for the rest of the presentation is, uh, is really we've I've kind of broken out the, the spaces and, and shown some of the development and the construction imagery that kind of went behind some of the detailing because one thing you guys will learn as you, as you kind of you know, graduate out of the program and get into firms, it's, it's, I don't say it's easy to design things, but it's, you know, it's the, with the software and, and uh, it, it's really easy to kind of conceptually envision this sort of space, but it's really what, comes, what it comes down to is when you try to build that and come up with the details, that's when it's really challenging. And so, you know, when you, when you conceive of something, like the very first image that Mike showed of our concept for, you know, we had glass boxes that were like no mullions floating, hanging over, you know, 30 feet, uncan you know, I mean, just, if it came to building that, that's where, you know, you take the step back and it, it all has to make sense. So this, this sort of next sequence of slides will really start to illustrate how we go through that. And, and obviously it's going to change things, but at the end of the day, you really want to preserve that concept, your original concept. And you go through the hoops and the challenges to, to make it work. You push your structural engineer and you push your, you know, your mechanical. Uh, I mean, the mechanical guys, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's not a single exposed mechanical uh, um, diffuser down below, except I think maybe along the window here, but everything is like tucked up into the coves and I mean it was really challenging work for everybody involved to kind of really pull this off. It's a little bit different here and I, one thing I should also mention is um, where you know there's a sort of a conformance to a, uh, a prototype on that lower level. This was not in that sort of prototype so Jeff had a, a little bit more leeway to kind of like do something like this where we're exposing the structure and he's saving money but you know, never would you ever like have this type of look in the showroom. It just wouldn't be allowed. So there's this sort of transition that happens as you kind of move towards the showroom where we kind of go back to the showroom tile and the, you know, the clean ceilings and the lighting. I mean, I've got the ceiling plan in here. We'll have a quick look at the lighting packages through the roof. So um, oh, let me just, oh yeah. So this is the programming sequence I just wanted to kind of touch on real quickly. You know, the car kind of comes up here, so it loops around. This is where they've got all this, you know, this was built first, this, this sort of pragmatic box. And then as this sort of came online, um, a lot of the function from the, the building to the north started to move into here. And then the guys focused really on the construction of this. So, you know, that, this, this administration piece, that offices we walked by, those were existing components. This was the existing secondary car showroom. Uh, again, we just sort of freshed up some paint and just sort of left it. So there's the, yep. So yeah, so terrace is right here. So you can see it's, so this is, this is sort of starting to dive down and then we start to cut down and we're, while, we're, while we're bending out here and cutting down, we're also curving. And then it's also tying into, you know, a wall here that's canted and turning at its own, you know, uh, radius. And so this is, this is where it gets really challenging and it's above the, the canopy space at that point, and like I say, the clearance issues, the structure—it was—it was something else. Um, this gives you a sense, really, of the of the overall planning of of the facility. So, you know, this is broken up into body shop here. We've got the paint booths, um, detailing and car wash, showers and locker space for employees. Um, you know, back here, this is you know, coming in, you're bringing your Ferrari in for service. You pull in, you get out of your car. They basically take it in from here for service and you know you can go hang out in the lounge wait for your oil change and then the car parking up top um, parts storage here car so a lot of the you know a lot of the a lot of inventory held on site so it's brought up on the car lift and just stored in this space and then this is the bridge that we talked about so you know basically the intent is that they would operate in this facility entirely well, this went under construction. We were under construction for, I think, 18 months. So it was a long time they lived and operated out of, out of the old Chevy building. So now this Chevy building is closed and they're looking to sell off this property. And they're ent entirely on this site. So there's, there's the building, um, you know, kind of getting into demolition in, in uh, winter 2016. That's that column line that we talked about. And it really became challenging because what happens is that stair weaves itself through this column line. So we had to really sort of look at how we bust through here and then come back and then really encapsulate a lot of this in the red wall. And then wherever we left it exposed, just you know, deal with it and paint it. There's the rear addition under construction. This is the the extruded window, so this large cantilever plate sort of 
because if you go out here and, and have a look up at the windows, you'll see these, these boxes actually project out um, almost 12 inches, I think, and, and sort of dealing with that is, it, it becomes a bit of a structural challenge. So starting to take shape in spring 2017, um, you can see the sort of framing. This is for the most part like ready to kind of get the uh, panels, just it's basically an insulated sandwich panel that gets tipped up and locked in place. That completes the back and as we kind of move through, you know, into the stud framing work on, uh, on the front edition, you, you start to really understand the complexity, you know, they're leaving like areas like at the corners, just leaving it open. There's a there's such a tight tolerance when they deal with the metal panels, and this is what Mike's going to get into a little bit, where the, the um, you know, the guys, the, the, the metal panel contractor is like mandating such tight tolerances that these guys are like putting this up by hand. It's like impossible in a way to, uh, to really hit that, and so you'll see how we kind of overcame that challenge. So it's starting to take shape, and again, it's just the density of cold form in, in order to kind of build, right, you know, the sort of the cants and the angles and, and, and really, you know, pick, pick up this sense of movement in the, in, in the, in the outside form. It really becomes, a, you know, a masterwork in, in cold form framing. And DCC Construction, who was the construction manager, self-performed all of this framing. So... This is, this is kind of a really interesting pro uh, product. We've used it um, on a number of uh, uh, projects now, and it's called, uh, it, it's called Smart CI. And so what it is is it's, it's, an, it's a rigid insulation, and it's, you know, if you think to the traditional construction, you know, you've got your, your interior drywall, gypsum, your vapor barrier, your insulation in a cavity, and then outboard of that, some sheathing, and then your metal panel system. Well, this Allevi you know, it just simplifies everything. In this particular case, we've got an empty cavity, so we've got our drywall that goes right up against our, our studs, an empty cavity, and then the green girt system eliminates the need for a vapor barrier and an air barrier because it's integral to the system, and it eliminates the need for sheathing. It acts as sheathing, so this essentially all locks into place, and it allows that building to, you know, one, get enclosed extremely quickly, and then um, allows the, you know, the interior to kind of get um, controlled environmentally so that you could start on some of that interior work. So it's a, it's a little bit more, you're paying a little bit more of a premium to kind of have it done, but you're operational and, and up and working a lot quicker than, say, moving the traditional route. Probably another really interesting thing about this particular system is the girt itself is a composite, so yes. you don't have any thermal bridging in uh, the fastening uh, um, that's happening in between them, so it's, it's, it's really an efficient system, right. uh, both from practicality of installation but also uh, for performance. Correct. And you can see here, this is the, you know, the projection of the window and the, and the cantilever plate that starts to kind of get worked through. Um, some of the, you know, just going to see sort of a, a collection of images now that represent the spaces we just toured. So this, you know, the stair, the, the line of the existing columns along here, you know, the framework of this sort of mezzanine stair tying into the new steel structure, the, the entry. Um, you know, the guys worked meticulously on the, on the gypsum board. They just, just, they did such a fantastic job. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's perfect if you go through. I mean, trying to find sort of uh, imperfections in the, in the gypsum, it's, 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 it's impossible. Maybe something to touch on there that I, that I think is, um, it's inherent in the culture of Ferrari that sort of comes with it, right? That there's this kind of meticulous um, attention to detail and perfection. And so you have that inherent within this. So like a company like Glasgow who did the glass, you know, go look at the glass detailing and sort of the radius of the corners. And they took a lot of pride in the fact that, hey, we're, we're building Ferrari, right? But I think it's also something that when you kind of set a precedent for what a project is going to be and it's important and it has this kind of cultural quality and you build that into it, there's contractors that can actually do amazing work. So I think you know, it's just something to connect to to make sure that, hey, as you're working with a collaborative relationship from client, owner, uh, architect, and contractor, that you contribute to building that culture of what that looks like. And that, in a lot of ways, pays off in the quality of construction that he's talking about. Because this would be a very different space if people were just kind of in and out and there to get it done. That's, that's absolutely true, and I mean, and, and that was the case from, from the guys doing the tile, 
to the metal pan. I mean, it, they were just committed. They knew the end product. They could see it, and they and they they could see ahead to what it meant for them, you know, for their company and for them as individuals having worked on that sort of space. So, it took a lot of pride, and and we've got to know a lot of the contractors working on this project. And I mean. They would stop by on the weekends, bring their families through. They were that, like that proud of their craftsmanship. So it was, it was really cool to see. So some of the detailing, um, you know, that gets into, you know, the wall sections and, you know, the complexity of like just, you know, installing this um, glass rail without any sort of handrail or, or, or sort of connectivity across the top. It really, everything anchors into, um, you know, a bent steel plate that, that gets connected into the mezzanine structure. Really, there's details that were eliminated at one time this you know this there was like a frameless glass system called finwall where there was no structural mullion it was just all glass supporting glass and i mean it was probably about three times the cost of what we're what we have installed and so that was a concession where we just like well you know what we got to we got to go with the standard curtain wall because we just can't afford this this glass system um, reflected ceiling plan, again, just showing you the level of, you know, attention to the lighting. I mean, it was, I think the fixture package alone was $300,000, so just for this area here. So, I mean, the, the, the lighting and how these things set up over the cars, it's, it's just so controlled and, and well thought out. It's, it's, you know, it's all part of the brand. I think so now that you've had a chance to focus on the cars when you were down there, next time you can go up and sort of, like, <laughs> appreciate the, the ceiling, so... <laughs> Um, this is that delivery area we were standing in and, you know, kind of like driving out sort of through here and, and we've sort of, you seeing here on the edge right here and right here we've put in a new elevator in order to kind of get, you know, people up here. People can't ride in the car elevator. So it was a man elevator to get access to the mezzanine level. So that was another little challenging because we're coming down, we're digging down and we're up against the footings of the existing building. So lots of, lots of on-site gymnastics just trying to kind of get around it, and that happens anytime you're like working with existing conditions it's always challenging nothing's ever plumb or level and nothing's ever how it is on the drawings you get into the ground and you find pipes and you know footings that you just didn't know were there so this is the shot you know the configuration room kind of under construction the niches these things here just as this is just like a um, a molded plexiglass interior and it's all lit with LED sort of through there and that happens at each of them. Um, some of the some of the millwork details in behind the you know these custom niches. It's really challenging. A lot of the a lot of this material too imported from Italy. So up here in the mezzanine, which we've kind of talked about already a little bit. You know the rigor in the cold form. And then just talking a little bit, like this is you kind of see how the, that sort of gets molded and sort of clad in, in uh, as, it, as it's part of the exterior. Um, you know, we get into the plywood, we don't need the smart CI out there, but I mean, just such a challenge to make this work with the sloping roof and the sloping facade and the curves. A very late addition to, like, I mean, we're well under construction. And Jeff's sort of envisioning the space and this fireplace was, was added in and so we had to revisit, well, how does this work? And, you know, we've got mechanical kind of going through there. And, um, you know, how, what does he want to achieve with this? And so we end up with a sort of peninsula fireplace. And I, I, I mean, this is, I think it's like $25,000, $30,000 fireplace. So it's, it's, pretty, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty intense. All right. And then just some of the images as we, as we near kind of, you know, completion. This was one of the last images I took as they were, you know, just getting ready, and you can see this is all low iron glazing in that. So I don't know if you've noticed in, you know, certain, certain pieces of glass have like a green tint that, because they have a high iron content. Um, you're, you're increasing your costs by getting that iron out, but you get, this, you get this clarity that exists. Like this is the sort of view at night, right, from Orchard Lake. It just, I mean, it just pops, and that, that's the same up here. We've got these cars in the windows. They really just kind of glow. There's, there's no interruption in the glass at all. So some of the sections, so this, uh, you know what, I wish I would have put in the section through that terrace, but I didn't. But you can kind of see the depth that we're dealing with, and, and as we step out there, there's like a, um, you know, there's a good 12 inches of depth. These are, that's like a sort of a built-up system called bison, and, um, you know, there's a sort of a sloping. You really start to push into the structure, and 
how that actually works. There's actually a one inch thick plate really that carries a lot of that deck out there. And then, Mike, I'm going to kind of hand it over to you. We start getting in a little bit into the panelization on the exterior and, and really in order to kind of get to this spot, we needed to do a few things. And, and uh, this really has to do with, um, I think this transition of not only how it contributes to this project, but how we're thinking in projects to the future. So even if you kind of go back to the idea of the density of cold form framing that was here for Corey, what we wanted to say is, okay, we learned a lot of things in, in uh, terms of um, morphological experimentation and some tools that we use to accomplish that. And so we'll show some of those, but also what are the lessons learned to take us uh, in, into the future of the sort of next uh, phase of doing this? So um, you get a little bit of sense of the panelization that's here, but again, coming back and looking at the cold forming and the exacting, and I'd really encourage you guys, as you kind of you go out to the terrace as you're leaving the building, really look at the tolerances, and it's incredible to look at the craftsmanship of the metal panels themselves. Everything is, is tightly done, it's sort of it's perfectly made, and, and you, the only way we were able to accomplish that is through digital fabrication of the panels, but what happened is, uh, Corey talked about the lack of the ability to have uh, tolerances um, uh, within the framing, but there's an exact thing that happens with the metal panels themselves, right? Every panel is essentially digitally modeled. It goes to the fabricator. It's, it's all made to exacting conditions. So what we had to do is after we had the cold form framing is essentially you do a digital scan of the existing cold form framing so that that becomes uh, a model, right? So the whole thing is mapped and then it's put together as uh, effectively a model. So you get a sense of, you know, we're now wrapping to kind of the uh, southwest or southeast portion um, into the uh, southwest portion of the building. There you can see, right, that sort of terrace that's essentially uh, within that that's made. So everything is essentially uh, point cloud scanned. Um, and then we take the point cloud scan and the idea was to then take the metal panel model and manipulate it to match the point cloud scan. So you get a little bit of a sense. I may need to kind of rotate this here. I may or may not be able to get this one to work. Subi's ball. Subi's ball. I don't know why it's. Uh, you could probably hit escape and play it from that. Like hit escape. I'll do it from here. There you go, it's working now. So right, the whole thing is reconfigured. We talked about the kind of, call it the stem, uh, that's sort of there. So what happened when we did this whole scan, right, is we remodeled the whole thing, but there was a lot of effort put into this particular piece. And uh, so when the metal panel manufacturer came back, they just kind of thought, hey, this will probably match up with what the other one is. So it's one of those things, right? Like you come back as a you know, design team and you're looking at it and it's like, we can't get past the inset. So it break, right? Everything that we did to kind of keep the continuity in the reality of it was broken. <laughs> so we're still in conversation with the metal panel manufacturer to kind of you know, resolve this type of thing. But that's where it becomes really important to um, make sure that all of your collaboration and, and, and all of your connections are essentially uh, made so that you, you accomplish everything. But it was, it was interesting just to see the kind of skill that they were able to do through digital fabrication in terms of achieving that kind of level of perfection. And it was very much seen like the precision that's in a vehicle comes to the precision of the finish of, of this building um, became very evident in it. And that kind of takes us to um, Lessons learned for a project that's uh, nearing completion now, the, the Providence Pedestrian Bridge. But we just wanted to illustrate, this was also a project where you see it's sort of broken up into these five foot sections, which you can see, but sort of the compound curves uh, that are happening uh, within it. It has a very fluid quality to it. Um, you may not even be able to tell here, but the depth of this changes at every panel and you can see where um, sort of curves start to emerge and wrinkle sort of within uh, the skin of this whole thing. And so it was really important um, to sort of figure out how to accomplish that. So what we like to do is sort of show, right, this is, this is what we do to win the competition, but this is the model that we had to make that image. So you can imagine it's two very different things. This is just a lot of Photoshop and yeah, 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 you know, here's the intent. And then there's the kind of like how you come to reality. So 
what we see is how projects kind of work in parallel uh, with one another. So while we were working on this, we're also dealing with the skinning of that. So what we're finding is Rhino becomes a great tool for NURBS and for you know, making uh, compound curvatures. And that worked for essentially this project, but when we, when we, or for Ferrari, but when we get into this and there's sort of small manipulated changes, it's incredibly painful to try to manipulate each one. So Wait, what- I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to yeah, point out one thing because I love this. This is, this, is what, this is what it looks like when an architect designs structure. This is <laughs> yeah. what it looks like when a structural engineer comes in. <laughs> so, they, and, and unfortunately we're living with the reality of this, but it's, it's not that it's bad. Different. Yeah, it's different. It's not different. that bad. So. That's true. Architect kind of mid went there and then we got it closer back. <laughs> probably, probably closer to 30% yes. hopefully is, yes. is where we ended up. That is very true. Um, but you can see where this started to work uh, is essentially you know, getting it to five foot sections. But um, then that was really the application of where Grasshopper came in. And I was telling Carl I had it. So uh, Zuby, who's um, essentially our uh, digital guru in the office is, is not here to do his part of the presentation today. And he had the keys to the video that shows how this works and we couldn't get it because he's in Nigeria uh, proposing to his fiance. So congratulations, <laughs> Zub. <laughs> Cute anecdote. So, um, but what was interesting is he had a lot of uh, conversations with people so that uh, effectively what we could do is he broke this up into five different sections, which are color coded within this. And then imagine creating scripting in uh, Grasshopper, where effectively, if I look at this piece, what he did is he created an interface so that I could just pull one side to the other, and this would sort of slide in or slide out, depending on uh, the overall adjustment that needed to be made. And so what happened a lot of times is we would get information back from the structural engineer with the primary structure, and suddenly something is sticking out. And you can imagine, panel by panel, he's going to have to like readjust this whole thing, as opposed to scripting just allowed him to evenly smooth that whole thing out. So we found it to be incredibly powerful to take the lessons learned here where we just kind of made it to skin it to then start to do scripting so that we could more quickly go through these iter iterations and, and uh, deal with adjustments. And then also sort of working back to this idea that we uh, talked about the density of the cold form framing here, working very closely in collaboration with fabricators. So you have the panel which is originally uh, rationalized, then it automates kind of creating boards and the armatures the tagging, and then unrolling and cut tagging. So effectively, you get a whole system like this that's essentially put in, and the scripting is still capable, if we end up having structure that comes out, to make that overall adjustment, that it literally uh, can work from the system all the way from the individual panels, all the way to the armatures and, and the components. And so then all those are effectively digitally fabricated, and you see how they come out in individual panels, and then this is how uh, it goes up. So what we're finding is that the, the learning is giving us the opportunity to sort of move through the morphological changes in a much more iterative and quicker process. Yeah, and then also for the digital <laughs> fabrication component to achieve things that you can see that it's pretty easy for these guys to sort of take these sections at five feet in a time and sort of put them together. And so and this is better. where the, the column's looking better there. Yeah, the column's looking better. Um, although each one has to change because the width of the bridge right. changes, it which narrows. is why they're, they're all different. So again, um, I don't know what Corey's problem is. He can't make anything the same at all. Everything is different. That's not necessarily <laughs> only his fault. Um, but uh, it's been great to be able to, to continue. And I would say that there's a tremendous amount of LTU alumni that's been involved in this. So um, everybody should be really proud, I think, as a university. Um, I think we have almost the entire alumni of uh, LTU uh, DigiFab Lab um, <laughs> <laughs> in the office. Um, but even our other partners, you know, Ken and Gina Van Tyne, and, and, and I think one of the things that's important to realize uh, within this is, um, although Corey and I are kind of representing the presentation, there's a lot of people that it goes into. Um, Ken handles so much of the technical aspects of what's going into these things, and you guys are going out to commission essentially the lighting uh, on this bridge a little bit later uh, this month. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Gina kind of handling operations, and Pondouche is here too, and done a lot of uh, digital modeling as well. So 
Um, I think one of the things that we've really enjoyed as an office is the kind of collaboration of everybody's skill sets that sort of comes together to allow these things to happen. So um, with that, thank you and enjoy the rest of uh, the facility that's here and we'll answer any other questions that may come up too. I think that's it, right? Yeah. for doing this. No thank you to the dealership. Also, thank you to eLearning for helping to film this tonight. I mean, it shows a really great example. It's great to also see the progression where we talk about design, technology, and practice, and all three of those things coming together here tonight. So I want to thank you. This is great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Questions from the audience? All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we covered everything. <laughs> We can also, oh, I see a question. Yeah. So when you guys are talking about like the insulation boards, how it's like kind of everything in one, like I imagine that's cost, that costs more than your average insulation board, but what are like the savings that you get rather than doing the traditional layers? Like obviously you get the compact section that you needed, but like, did you actually have a cost savings on that as opposed to traditional construction methods? I don't know if we, in, like, it's hard, because we just did a project after this in Ann Arbor and we, we actually had to value engineer that out and went to more of a traditional uh, sort of way to insulate a uh, you know, cavity because of the cost. So I, there's certainly advan there's advantages in, like Mike was saying, the sort of thermal enclosure. You're really benefiting it benefiting that on that side of things but um, I mean I don't do you know specifically if there's any I, don't, I think it's it's almost project by project we run into this frequently um, you might have in one installation I mean this is kind of a complicated answer but if we have to pay prevailing wage which is going to be higher so your labor cost is effectively going to be higher it goes up so seamlessly and quickly that it saves on layer after layer that you have to do installation so in that sense it may be a cost savings, actually. So you never know from project to project. I, I find that we have these conversations all the time where one contractor says, oh, it's cheaper if you do it this way, and then you do it, and then somebody else bids, and like, oh, we could save you a lot of money if you did it this way, and you're like, mm -hmm. it just came from that discussion like three months ago, and, and that wasn't the case. So I, I think when you get down to things like that, it's, it's really hard to say. I, I would probably actually say it's probably almost cost neutral on mm -hmm. average. Um, and, and we're seeing green gert happen more often, but that probably, I think that application, Grace Bible, was something that was low labor cost. Right. So, you know, it, it, it kind of neutralizes what the um, compactness of the system and ease of installation would be. Um, I, I'm, you probably worked on a budget, like you said, but earlier you said you had to focus on detail. All right, and um, I just wanted to ask, did you ever, did you consider like highlighting the cars? So in the interior, maybe elevating the cars from the floor so they can move, or like the lighting is pretty general right now. Did you ever consider like maybe making them, you know, focused on just one car and then it starts to like shine? And I'm, I'm just asking, because like showrooms, uh, so I don't know if you, the, the Lamborghini showroom in Dubai, it's like insane, they have like this, skylights that kind of like just come down to one Lamborghini and you're like, why would you do that? But did you think um, about something like that? It's kind of, it's, it's, it's really, it actually, there's, they do have, so Ferrari has a system, it's a barisol system, so essentially it's the footprint of the car and it's sort of, it's, it's usually in, installed in like a gypsum ceiling and it's completely and entirely lit so you've got this sort of diffuse glow that sort of hits the car and we actually had two of them, uh, you know, sort of like they were supposed to be here, but we saved so much money by removing the gypsum exposing the structure that that, that idea kind of went away. You know, the, the, these cars here were the two that we looked at maybe like, you know, because of the angle of, you know, view, do we try and raise them up and, or tip them up a little bit towards, it complicated things, they do change them out quite often. So it really, you know, I think this was an example of, uh, you know, application of VR as well. We put the car in, put on the VR goggles, stepped out to the street, really to say, do, are we cutting off half the car, you know, with, with the angle of view? And it actually really doesn't cut much off. It's, we've, we've tried to keep, you know, the, 
the, f the frame as flush to the floor as, as possible. And then the lighting you know, around the perimeter of these openings is meant to really sort of like hit these cars so that when you're outside seeing them, you know, you're seeing a well-lit car. Again, this area didn't conform necessarily to the Ferrari prototype, and, and so it doesn't have all like the lights that, I mean, you go down there, I mean, those lights are specifically positioned to really highlight that car as much as possible. And you don't want, uh, it, you don't want like the glare, you don't want to be hammering it so much that the light is sort of detracting, right? You don't want this sort of like glow to kind of happen over the car, so. That I think your what you're going to find with, with Ferrari, there is, a, there is a philosophy about curation. So I think what you'll find that even though this um, project has some formal expression to it, when you really look at it, it is that kind of cleanness and simplicity that he goes back to that you're not seeing a lot within this. There's a, there's a lot of effort that went into letting things kind of disappear and it being about the cars. So, you know, in the areas where you're seeing it, it's not about lighting package and sort of, hey, what's this, um, you know, sort of pump up the music and get, it's very much, this is about the cars. It's, it, you know, about their philosophy and sort of highlighting that. Um, I think it's kind of interesting too, Corey had mentioned, you know, kind of, hey, you bring one person into a Ferrari, they get the first one, they go the next one. And so just anecdotally, um, I happen to know somebody who had, if you look at the black uh, it's, that's a 328 GTS, but he had a, a black 308 GTS, then progressed to the Mondial, which is the next one that you see there, and it was a red one, and then progressed to the Testarossa, which is the third one there, and it's, it's almost like there was this sort of sense of exactly how they progress you from vehicle to vehicle uh, as a part of the culture. Um, I don't know as much recently how that works, but it is a testament to the idea that, hey, they kind of bring people into the Ferrari family, the lifestyle. And so, like when you're talking, hey, what's the newest way that people are doing things? No, it's more like, a, hey, this is a consistency of excellence that stays, but it's very much about the vehicles. It's, it's so nice and cozy back here by the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, it's warm. <laughs> um, Corey was also mentioning earlier, and I don't think people heard him, but the X, the diagonal bracing that you see over the stair, and that's that had to do with the old building to the new building, or Correct. maybe it, talk a little bit about that. It really wasn't. Um, that was a call to Jeff too. Like I saw these things showing up in the in the structural drawings, and and if you go downstairs, and I don't know if we've got an image, maybe we'll back up, but um, as you come down around, there's there's a pair of them like in the showroom windows as well. And it's like I called up Darvis and Eric, Eric Myers, our, our structural engineer over at Darvis, and it's like, Eric, what are these cross braces doing in the, in the window? He's like, we got to have them. They're like lateral bracing, right? So, I mean, so, you know, it's, it is, it, it all, he did his best. I mean, the, the structural, uh, I think, I want to say there were 392 steel shop drawings for this building. So... Uh, I mean, it was just, it was an intense structural endeavor just to like be hanging out and like, again, you talk about like the sort of the, it's one thing to be hanging out and maybe changing direction, but when you're like hanging out, descending and curving, it really, it, it really is a testament to structural engineer to pull that off. This floor, I remember we we'd just poured it, the walls were not, the contractor came up here and the whole thing was like bouncing and he calls me, he's like, the, the mezzanine's bouncing. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So I drive out and I'm like, I called Air Darvis, the mezzanine's bouncing, what's going on? They drive out here and now they get, no, 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 it'll be fine. It'll all kind of, you know, we'll get it all, it'll be like, a, it's like a big diaphragm, right? We'll get us all enclosed. The mezzanine will be fine. I, I haven't felt it bounce since they put up the wall, so I, I trust that they did their job. <laughs> so yeah, all of that is, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just required. It's, it's tying into that existing building. I think also one of the interesting things that he pointed out is the 392 shop drawings. Um, imagine the kind of back and forth of all of that was also something looking at uh, the delivery method for the bridge. So where we were actually able to deliver the, the kind of that skin model that we showed you was part of the deliverable so that the fabricator could essentially take that, build his model from it, and then give it back to us as a shop drawing to review. So far less shop drawings on probably something that was a lot more complex than what we had here. So again, it's kind of taking those stages of how do we simplify this but still be able to deal with as much formal expression uh, as a project uh, would like to see in it. 
Thank you guys for taking the time tonight. This was great. Yeah, thank you.